Let's go and get into our message for today, and we're going to be talking about that sinful nature of ours just a bit more. Uh, but uh, in our journey through the stories of the Old Testament uh, these past few weeks, as you recall, we have been looking at the life of David. And we looked at, at the beginning, we looked at the story of David being anointed as king. And as you recall, outwardly, he was really the least qualified to be king. But we saw in that story that God looks at the heart not at the outward qualities. And so we learned that what matters to God is not how we look outwardly, but how we look inwardly. And what we learned even more uh, concerning God is that what matters to Him is that we look like Christ, reflecting His love, His peace, His joy, His kindness. And I was just saying a moment ago, His generosity and so on. And then we also looked at the story of David and Goliath, and we learned how to face our fears and we learned that in that story, David represents Jesus. Jesus, who, who faces and defeats everything that causes us to fear by his life and by his suffering and by his death on the cross. And then we face our fears not so much by what we do, by, by banishing our fears from us or, or by boldly confronting it on our own. We deal with our fears by focusing on Christ and his victory. We focus on what He has done for us and the victory that He has given to us to defeat fears. We focus on Christ, and we don't focus on that Goliath of our fears. Now, last week we saw that David finally reigning as king, or is reigning as king. Many years had passed since his encounter with Goliath, and as king, David wanted to build a permanent house for God. And that's because the people of Israel were still using the tabernacle from the time of Moses. Now remember, the tabernacle was an elaborate portable tent. So David wanted to build a permanent structure, a temple, a house for God. And God said, no, no, David. Instead, I'm going to build you into a house. In other words, into a dynasty. An eternal dynasty, in fact. And that dynasty culminated in David's descendant, Jesus, who is the eternal king, the king of kings. And he is reigning now in our lives, and he will be reigning forever. Now today, we have another well-known story, a famous story in the life of David. But unlike the famous story of David and Goliath, this is a rather dark and sad story that reveals the deep flaws and the sinfulness of David. Now, on a side note, a little bit of a sidebar I'm going to take here, the fact that this story is even in the Bible actually gives evidence that the Bible is reliable and true. You see, in ancient times, when the accounts and the stories of kings were recorded, well, only the good and positive things were written down. The king's victories in battle and the positive things that he accomplished for his people. These are the things that were recorded. Anything that made the king look bad, well, that wasn't written down. And if you look at ancient uh, records or manuscripts of kings and empires, there are no records of losses in battle or anything that would impugn the character of the king. But the Bible doesn't do that. Here we have a story that paints the character of King David in a very negative way. And so the fact that this story is in the Bible at all is evidence that we are receiving the full and the true story of King David. And it is also evidence that we are receiving the full and true story of God's work in David's life and also the full and true story of what God wants us to learn. So let's take a look at that story this morning. One spring, King David sent out Israel's army. Instead of going with them, David put another man in charge, and David stayed in Jerusalem. One evening, David looked out from his palace and saw a beautiful woman named Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah, one of the best warriors in David's army. David sent his messengers to get Bathsheba, and she came to David's house. Later, Bathsheba told David that she was going to have a baby. The baby was David's. David knew he had sinned, so David made a plan to make sure no one found out that Bathsheba's baby was his. 
First, David called Uriah home from battle. Then David told Uriah to go spend time with his wife. But Uriah didn't think it was fair for him to relax at home while the other men were at war. Uriah slumped on David's doorstep and refused to visit his wife. No matter what David did or said, Uriah did not go home to his wife. David's plan was not working, so he made a new plan. He instructed the leader of the army to send Uriah into the hardest part of battle so that he would be killed. This time, David's plan worked. Uriah was killed in battle. David took Bathsheba into his house to be his wife, and she had a baby boy. God knew what evil things David had done. God sent Nathan the prophet to talk to David. Nathan told David a story. A traveler came to a rich man who had many animals. The rich man did not offer his own animal. Instead, he took a poor man's lamb, the only lamb he had, and he gave it to the traveler to eat. This story made David feel angry. The rich man should die, David said. You are the man, Nathan said. God had given David a position of great power, and David took what wasn't his. David realized he had sinned against God. David deserved to die. You won't die for this, Nathan assured David, but God will punish you. Your son will die instead. When David repented of his sin, God forgave him, but sin always comes with a price. God spared David's life, but David's son died. When we sin, we deserve death, but we can receive God's forgiveness because God sent his son, Jesus, to pay the price for our sin. All right. So by this time in David's reign, Israel had become really the superpower of the day. David had built Israel into the strongest military power and wealthiest nation of that time. And it was a glorious time for Israel. And this, by the way, is why people in Jesus' time were hoping that Jesus was going to reestablish a kingdom like David, rich and strong and powerful. And Jesus said that his kingdom would be rich and strong and powerful, but it would be spiritually rich and strong and powerful, and, and the people weren't so interested in that. And the truth is, the world is still not interested in that kind of a kingdom, but that's another sermon. For David, this was a comfortable time. There was still conflicts to deal with, but David just sends his army with General Joab, and he takes care of it. You know, normally the king leads the army, but David doesn't need to do that anymore. And so he has time on his hands. And what do human beings with time on their hands have a tendency to do? Get into trouble. And so David is on the roof of his palace one day, a leisurely time, and he sees Bathsheba. And he ends up coveting Bathsheba. And then he commits adultery with Bathsheba. And then he lies to cover it up. And then part of that cover-up ends up murdering, or he ends up murdering Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. And then, of course, he's ignoring God's word concerning all of this. I mean, David breaks half the Ten Commandments in this one story. This is David. This is the man who wrote all those beautiful psalms. This is David, a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. In Psalm 40, verse 8, David writes, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Good and faithful David. And yet, we have this ugly story of David and Bathsheba. What is this story telling us? And it's this. The seeds of the deepest sins reside in every human heart. Because of our sinful nature, the capability of the darkest human behaviors exists in the heart of all people, you and I included. And this is true for even the best of people, even the people who are Christians, who belong to the people of God. The story of David and Bathsheba tears down our tendency to underestimate our sinful nature. It reveals our bias when we look at the world and we think, oh, I would never be that bad. I would never, never do those terrible things. And while it may, be, may very well be true that you would never do those things, the story reminds us that the seeds for those things, the seeds for the darkest sins remain in us. 
The capability is there. Look at David. Look at your life. Do you see self-pity, envy, pride, self-centeredness? Do you know what those seeds can become if they fall into the right soil, if they're allowed to be nurtured and grow and grow? I mean, they will produce terrible fruit, terrible attitudes, terrible behaviors. One of the lessons of this story is that the worst of sin and evil still resides and lives in our hearts. And the capability to act on that sin and evil is all very real. I mean, why is it so hard for us to say, I'm sorry? For human beings to genuinely, without reservation, to humbly admit, I was wrong, I'm sorry, is almost impossible to say. Why? It's because our human nature, our sinful nature, doesn't want to admit that we're that bad, that we messed up. We don't want to believe that the sin and evil in us is that pervasive and real. And why is that? Because it rips at our pride. It rips at our pride that we're better than that. It rips at our self-image that we are better than most people. It forces us to confront, confront the truth that we are not as good as we think we are and that we are capable and guilty of genuinely bad behavior. And so we make excuses. We blame circumstances. We accuse others, all so that we can avoid accepting the blame and avoid having to say, I'm sorry, I've sinned. But in this story, this is exactly what David does. The prophet Nathan confronts David with his sins, and he says, you're the man. You're the one who has done this evil. And David doesn't make excuses. He doesn't try the blame game. Samuel, 2 Samuel 12 records that David simply said, I have sinned against the Lord. And then... Listen to what Nathan says. Hear what Nathan says in response to David. Immediately after David says, I have sinned against the Lord, this is what Nathan says. The Lord also has put away your sins. And this is the point of the story. The point of the story is not only to reveal the depth of sin and evil that resides in human hearts. We need to know that and understand that. But more importantly, it is to reveal the even greater depth of God's grace in response to our sin. God's grace is the whole point of this story. And really, that's the whole point of the Bible. The whole point of the Bible is that God continually and persistently gives His grace to people who don't deserve it. The point of the Bible is that all people, including the best of people who have ever lived, have not, will not, and cannot overcome their sin of self-centeredness. But if they cling to the grace of God, they will triumph. The whole point of the Bible is that we will triumph because of Christ. Christ's victory, victory on the cross. Because Christ took that sinful nature of ours with all the seeds of darkness and evil. He took that on himself and he destroyed its power to destroy us. And yes, the power of sin still resides in us. And we see what it can do to us as we see in the story of David and Bathsheba. But there is a far greater power that resides in us by faith in Christ, and that is the power of God's grace. You will never be able to out God's grace. God's grace is always bigger than any sin in your life. Every once in a while, somebody says, I have sinned so much, I don't believe God can forgive me. You don't understand God's grace. Because God's grace is bigger than any sin that can be committed in this world by any person on this planet. When we look at our, our sinful nature, when we recognize the darkness that we are capable of, and when we see how undeserving we are of that incredible grace of God, 
That is the moment when that power of God's grace floods into our hearts. That is the moment that our hearts open to receive that amazing power of grace, and it changes us. And my friends, this is a daily thing. Our human nature continually wants to deny and to ignore the depth of our sinfulness. We're tempted to deny and downplay and underestimate our sins all the time. And so we need to daily remember how undeserving we are of God's grace, and yet we receive that grace so blessedly. We need to daily understand that. We need to daily recognize that. Remember our baptism, which pours that grace into our lives every single day so that we can appreciate and celebrate so much more how lavishly God in Christ has done for us, what he has done for us, pouring out that grace on us. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have shown us our sin. It's not easy for us, Lord, to accept that. We often try to push it back, deny it, make it look like it's not that big of a deal. Thank you when you show us exactly what it is and how desperately we are in need of your love and grace. And then thank you for pouring that grace into us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we move forward this morning from here, remind us daily that we are in desperate need of your grace. Remind us that it is never-ending. It never hesitates. It's always there. Lord, lead us to be people who live by grace, not by the sinfulness in our lives. Only the power of Jesus in us can make that happen. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us Jesus.